on in the morning, we um, finished on this um, the tour about cooling functions. So now we're going back to uh, galactic chaos. Mm -hmm. So uh, normally you would expect that if you have a cloud of gas or so gravitating or is hitting the potential of um, dark matter, then it should be denser at the center. Kind of makes sense. So if it's denser at the center, it also means that the cooling rate is higher at the center because cooling rate goes as density squared, right? And and so for uh, many dark matter chaos, in fact, you would expect for gaseous chaos actually, you would expect that the cooling time at the center is short and the cooling time on the outer path is long. And so there may, be, um, uh, um, there may exist this cooling radius, so the radius beyond which the cooling time is, is too long. Um, and so the gas will not uh, cool efficiently. And inside which uh, cooling time is actually short. And so the gas will be able to cool efficiently and then fold uh, condensed toward the center. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this picture, uh, I call it um, Moller and Bullock model in quotes because Moller and Bullock um, wrote that paper that discussed this uh, idea in detail, but of course they didn't invent this idea. Right? This existed well before them. They just um, uh, did a very sort of careful study of that. Um, so if we now take uh, dark matter here, right? this is dark matter profile, NFW, and we put uh, some gas in it. Right? This is a profile for distribution of gas under, um, in radiostatic equilibrium. And the gas uh, here would not have a core because gas is collisional, so it has finite entropy, which cannot decrease. Now we let this gas cool. Mm -hmm. So the density at the center, the cooling time is short. And so if they, this is in fact actually a new way like here, which is cooling radius um, is quite large. So let's say this is a cooling radius right, for this halo. Uh, so the gas inside this radius will be able to cool and condense toward the center. So the density profile which we will get is actually this dashed line. So all this gas will cool and fall toward the center. It will lose its pressure support. Right? If it, uh, right now it sits in the hydrostatic equilibrium because it has pressure support. If it cools, it loses, and temperature goes down, it loses pressure support. So all this gas will be gone. What will be left is a tiny fraction of the original um, density profile, which will form go all the way to uh, cooling radius. And then beyond them, beyond the cooling radius, of course, the gas will remain in hydrostatic equilibrium. The cooling time there is long. So whatever the um, uh, original profile was will remain there. So we get dark matter here, or gaseous scale, which has this profile, and a large, am large amount of gas that will fall toward the um, galaxy in the middle. Now, if you think about how this gas can actually fall toward the center, there are two different scenarios, maybe more. Right? So I can think about two. So first, it can develop a cooling flow, just like the cooling flow in clusters. So you get a gas, it cools, and it gradually sort of falls down, flows to toward the center in a sort of quasi-spherical and smooth way. Um, it can also experience thermal instability, and instead of you know, flowing as a whole gradually and smoothly, um, it can form fragment into small clouds, and each of those clouds, like raindrops, will fall uh, onto the galaxy. So there are at least two different ways, um, and you can make a choice. You can you know, decide to belong to one party or the other, and then you can impatiently see what the end of the story will be, right? which party wins. I'm not giving it as a, as a quiz, as you will see, we'll see why. So, uh, do clouds exist in the halo of the Milky Way? Oh, well, yeah. So this is a map, again, of the halo of the Milky Way in H1, now in 21 centimeter line. They're looking at neutral hydrogen, and there are tons of clouds in, in the halo of the Milky Way. And there are really big ones. Well, that big ones are actually what's called a Magellanic extreme. That's not clouds formed due to thermal instability inside the halo. There's also actually uh, gas from large and small Magellanic clouds being stripped away um, by tidal forces, tidal, tidal interaction with the Milky Way and, and interaction between them and also something else. Um, but there are uh, a large number of other clouds, especially the small ones, are called high velocity clouds, often because that's how they're discovered um, in, um, in radio observations. And uh, so this is a relatively old, uh, old uh, picture uh, obtained with Parkes Telescope from Australia. Um, if you use RAC before that, then you find that even a large number of small clouds. So this is survey areas with this Gaufer survey, Galactic Gaufer, whatever it's called. 
Um, and each point here is actually a different cloud right, of H1. So there's an enormous number of clouds in the uh, uh, here of the Milky Way. Right? So the cloud part is also you who decided to belong to the cloud party should rejoice. And so, in fact, if when we look with high-resolution um, radio telescope, you look at individual clouds, right? um, they often have this what's called head tail morphology, right? So there's a peak, and there's like a tail of them uh, in uh, uh, this extension towards the tail or the head. We don't know which way they move, of course, <coughs> but they look like you know, a roundish cloud with, with a tail. Right? So I first Please, why? Most <laughs> <laughs> people on the back, the answer is this, they need tails to swim faster. So gas is ejected from the cloud center by the pressure force, and the momentum is conserved. <laughs> clouds are located in the Milky Way halo, and clouds are made out of gas, and gas is always regularly shaped. Okay, so who's for A? <laughs> Two, only three, four, good, good. At least you wake up, right? <laughs> uh, who is for B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. Oh, okay, uh -huh. okay, twenty, huh? <laughs> Who is for C? <laughs> no. It is conserved, you know, right? <laughs> um, who is for D? For E, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, there are, there are more than <laughs> 38 people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this one worked, right? It's a tricky question. I said oh, those are all going to be tricky, right? So the reason why um, they might have this morphology, right? so obviously there has to be force, right, that pushes the gas out of that. So the clouds are, um, are not in video equilibrium, so the pressure force there is actually, uh, their own pressure force is irrelevant. So the most likely explanation is that as they f fly through the halo, right, the hot halo is there, right? What we're talking about today is the hot halo of the Milky Way. And as they're flying through the halo, there is a ram pressure from the hot gas in the halo that pulls the gas out of them. So the reason why I have tails is because they're actually flying this way through the hot gas that surrounds them. So it's actually this answer, which is the right one. Right? The Milky Way has a halo, and that's the reason why they have those tails, because they're flying through it. Majority here lost. <laughs> <coughs> but will the, will the tail have some special orientation? Well, I if that, again, th this is just a hypothesis, right? We don't know for sure, but, but if th this is one of the um, sort of most obvious or those, uh, most likely explanations, then yes, they all have to be flying this way, right? And it's flying this way because there is a hot halo around it, which we don't see here in H1 because it's highly ionized. That gas at million degrees have a tight, tiny neutral um, fraction. So because the gas is there, it's flying in and, and being uh, sort of pushed, so disrupted on the out, outer parts and develop this tail of gas being swept up by the hot gas around it. Okay, so um, these high velocity clouds, and again, they do exist in the Milky Way. And there are, as I've seen, hundreds of them, if not thousands. Right? And so uh, we want to test this uh, cloud hypothesis. Or what we can also do is to look at um, uh, other galaxies, external galaxies, with a radio telescope and um, observe H1, uh, high velocity clouds. So I'm going to show you the observations of high velocity clouds and other galaxies. Yeah, that's all that's known about them <laughs> and other galaxies. So all those attempts actually failed. Right? So for so the proponents of the uh, uh, cooling flow um, body, it's good news. Those high velocity clouds are not found in other galaxies. Right? And just to give you an illustration what it means not found, right? those are H1 maps of Andromeda, M31, and NGC 891 and some other galaxy. And uh, here are the uh, predictions of what the halo of the Milky Way in H1 would look like if we put it at the, at the distance of Andromeda, we put it at the distance of uh, this 891. So this red stuff 
is this um, Magellanic stream, the gas being swept from the, um, uh, from the Milky Way, and this white stuff is this other clouds. Right? So we actually compare other galaxies, none of them have the spectacular features, spectacular tails, you know, and large number of clouds of H1. Right? So um, what it probably means is all those clouds that we see in the Milky Way halo are very, very close by. They are not really clouds forming in the halo through the thermal instability and raining down on the um, disk of the Milky Way. That was a hypothesis that existed for, was the, was the dominant hypothesis for a little while, but after observations of external galaxies didn't find those clouds with very high sensitivity in other galaxies, um, uh, it now seems to be disfavored. Right? So it's not very likely that those clouds are actually in the halo. Much more likely they are very close, somewhere on the outer parts of the disk of the Milky Way. And a few of them, in fact, have distances measured. And so the radio telescope, you can't really measure distance. What we see is a H1 somewhere there, right? but you don't know where it is. Right? So occasionally, very rarely, if you're very lucky, you'll have a star behind that cloud. If you have a star behind that cloud, then you'll see an absorption line in the cloud, and at least you know the cloud is in front of the star, not behind, because it cannot absorb the light from the star if it sits behind the star. So a few of, them, of those are actually in front of stars, and so in this case, you can put an upper limit. You still don't know where along the line of sight of the star it is, but at least you know it's in front of the star, not behind. So um, the prevailing view today is that these high-velocity clouds are actually nearby, right, because they're not found in other galaxies. And so they, they, in other words, they are not this cooling gas that falls on the Milky Way. They're not forming in the halo, they're forming somewhere very close to the disk. Maybe they're thrown out of the disk by feedback, whatever. Um, so the problem is um, looking for infinitral hydrogen with 21 centimeter lines because this line is ridiculously weak, right? The whole universe is transparent to it, you know, all the way to whatever, Big Bang. Um, um, and so uh, hydrogen also has other strong lines like Lyman alpha, right? But Lyman alpha is very difficult to excite, it's also in the, in the outer wallet. So it's hard to see it in emission. Um, you only see it, usually see it in emission either from strongly star forming galaxies or from you know, AGN. Um, there is another uh, ions which are useful. They're all metal ions, so you can only see them in the metal enriched gas, but most of the gas in the universe is metal enriched. So another one which is very useful is actually magnesium too. Right? Its initiation threshold is a 15 electron volts, so it's quite close to 13.6 uh, electron volts of hydrogen. So magnesium two, from point of view of being ionized, being ionized at the same time as hydrogen is ionized, and whenever hydrogen is neutral, magnesium two is likely to be neutral. Uh, and so, in fact, um, it's even more useful uh, for studying halos of nearby galaxies than Lyman lime alpha. Right? So the first question, why? And the second question, that is also oxygen one. Oxygen one is really, really like hydrogen. Right? So they're very, very similar. Its transition threshold is 13.62, whereas hydrogen, I think, is 5.6 or 5.8, something like this. So they just, you know, differ in fourth decimal place. Mm -hmm. Yet it's not used to study gaseous chaos. Mm -hmm. So it's the second question, why? I didn't have a prepared a quiz because it's hard. I couldn't, you know, think about nice, nice, nice way to trick you with those questions. Um, so who knows why? Angular momentum. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So why, why say magnesium 2 is good and oxygen 1 is bad? Uh, are they very different from the ions that are in the So what? <laughs> well, in order to observe, I, when I was a, 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 in high school, my, my physics teacher used to say that if you want to call a boy Peter, you at least have to have a boy. Right? If you want to observe some line absorption, you at least have to have a line. Right, so magnesium is very useful because, first of all, um, it has two lines in the visible spectrum. So it's very easy to observe. It's in the visible band, so you can go take a normal telescope, look at it. Um, and also it's a doublet. So you see two lines with different strengths, which the ratio of them is determined by atomic physics. So if you see those, those two lines, you know it's magnesium too, nothing else. Whereas oxygen actually doesn't have one, oxygen one, doesn't have any good lines in the visible spectrum. So it just, you know, it would be nice to observe it, but it doesn't have any lines, so you cannot do anything about it. That's the reason. So you actually have to have something with lines that you can observe. So magnesium, too, because of that, was used extensively in 
um, absorption studies. Right? So this is one of the um, plots that shows the equivalent weeds of magnesium toluene. Again, this is 3,000 tungsten, so we, uh, it's in the visible band. Um, or we just very close to the visible. Um, uh, versus the distance from the parent galaxy. So you look essentially how it is done. You look at, 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 a, at a quasar. You find the magnesium to absorption. And then you look for a galaxy nearby and through which halo this line of sight goes and then in which halo this magnesium absorption um, uh, appears. And so what you see is this um, large number of detections. It scaled a little bit with luminosity, but that is just for convenience. Think about the distance from the center of the galaxy. Um, so you see this number of absorptions, and then at some point, at distance about 100 kiloparsec million, those are only upper limits. So this line, for example, uh, explains the trend very well. So you have tons of magnesium-2 absorbing clouds in the inner part of the galaxy, or in the halo, and then at some radius, <coughs> it just drops to zero. Again, why? Who is brave enough? It's a cooling radius, again, right? So remember that the gas can cool and then at least in principle form clouds only inside the cooling radius and the outer parts of the halo, the cooling time is long, it's perfectly stable, it won't do anything. So uh, again, this is not a 100% proof, but the most likely explanation that what we're actually seeing here is a cooling radius. So that in fact is now an evidence in support of the cloud party, right? So we first started is talking about clouds in the Milky Way. Then we discovered that those clouds are not actually the cooling clouds that uh, we would expect if cooling happens through thermal instability and fragmentation into clouds. Then there are those magnesium-2 absorbers that actually may be those clouds in other galaxies. So as you see, the picture is actually very, very um, unclear. So whether the gas cools through the cooling flow and just smoothly flowing into the center of the galaxy, um, or it fragments into small clouds, which is then rain as raindrops, is completely open question. Right? So this is pieces of evidence I showed you that are not uh, kind of contradicting each other, are not consistent with each other. So what actually happens is very open. In the simulations, we know what happens. Simulations still flows right, very smoothly, but that's because of numerical resolution. Right? We usually don't resolve scales in which thermal instability will be operating. So uh, finally, what we can do is, okay, okay, uh, we have those observations, and then we can do, go and compare with uh, simulations. And I'm again using the six megaparsec, the second best, best studied galaxy in the universe. Um, um, actually, it's a, sorry, it's a, yeah, in the same booth. Um, and so this line is a representation of this plot before, I just shown us in different units and, and as, a, as a, and a cone density rather than uh, equivalent width. And these different color points are actually several galaxies from that simulation and you see how miserably they fail. Right? So those all galaxies have cooling radius of the order of 30 kiloparsecs, whereas the data tell us it should be 100 or more. And so why it fails, I don't know. Right? So it's another failure of the simulation that we actually don't understand. But on this optimistic note, I'm going to finish the story of the Havis. It just means that for you, there's tons of work left. So we're not going to old guys like um, me and Volker will not solve all the problems for you. So you have your job. And, um, and if you have any questions about the second part of the CGM, I can answer that. If not, we are going to the third part, which is ISM. So everything is clear about chaos and circumstances with nuclear. Well, um, uh, basically, the conclusion that I would like you to get from that is that you know nothing. <laughs> Um, but I think that is good because it's clearly understanding what happens in Havis will be the next frontier of uh, computational cosmology. It is already frontier, but it's, 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 it's a field in which uh, it will be very easy to make substantial progress. Right? And uh, whenever you make progress, you also make a name for yourself. So it's a good field to work for um, the beginning of your careers. Okay, so now we're going to uh, ISM. And um, you'll probably spend three lectures uh, roughly talking about gas and galaxies and different properties. And, and before we start, um, before we talk about properties of the gas, we start with a very brief overview of galaxy formation. Right? So as I said, uh, I am covering a very large field, and so in some places I go deeper, in some places I, I will be very shallow. So this is my 
one of the very shallow pieces. So I'm going to give you extremely uh, a shallow overview of how galaxies form. Right? Uh, so what I'm talking going to talk about is mostly based on a uh, more Mao and White model. Um, it's it's kind of old and uh, it's 98, um, but it captures the physics of what happens in galaxy formation pretty well. Right? So all the simulations we had uh, seen then only confirmed that the general picture of the galaxy <coughs> is correct. So we have gas which cools in the halo and then uh, flows in one way or the other onto the galaxy right, at the bottom of the potential well. Right, and there the gas settles into a galactic disk. Okay. So that's another quiz why it's a disk. Where is my <laughs> What? Okay. <laughs> Do you want to vote? Or you know the answer? Okay, so it didn't work, right? <laughs> so the idea was if you if you put it as a wrong answer a few times, then you get blinded. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, angular momentum is conserved, so you know it has to become a uh, form a disk, right? Because um, if there is if gas is cool, it means that it loses its pressure support. So the only force which can um, support the gas against collapse is, ro is rotation. Right. So the mass of the disk is then uh, in, the, in this model. Right. So we assume that some fraction of the total mass of the uh, halo goes to form this disk. So this is a fraction m little d. Let's say 5% right, of the total mass. So it's not 5% of baryons, it's 5% of the total mass. Right. So baryons it will be 30% or so. Um, the model also assumes that disks have exponential profiles, and this is an observational fact, as I'll show you. The disks are exponential. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't have a very good uh, understanding why they are exponential, but all of them are. So then you can compute the mass of the disk very easily if you know the, what's called the scale radius, radius at which disk is a um, um, characteristic scale of this disk and the central density. And then um, you assume that the angular momentum of this disk um, is some fraction of the total angular momentum of the halo. It doesn't have to be a no one to one, right? Actually, it cannot be one to one because it's only a fraction of the mass that goes. It's a total angular momentum, not specific angular momentum. So you know the angular momentum is a disk if it rotates with uh, constant velocity v sub c, and then you say it's a fraction of the angular momentum of the halo. So in order to finish this model, what we need is to know the angular momentum of the halo, and that's actually fortunately known very well. So um, what you can do is to define quantity, which is called the spin parameter lambda. It's the angular momentum of the halo, a binding energy of the halo, absolute value because halo, halo is a bound, so energy is actually negative to one half, gm five halves. This actually makes it dimensionless. So if you take angular momentum, take energy and mass plus g, you can make a dimensionless quantity called lambda. And from very early simulations, uh, we know, uh, and from the current one as well, that, uh, that this lambda and right, the spin parameter, the quantity that describes how fast the dark matter here is actually rotate, is distributed like normally. So it's a kind of random number, different halos will rotate with different lambda parameter. But the distribution of them is log normal with a fixed mean and fixed dispersion. And it doesn't depend on cosmology, the power spectrum, the redshift, the mass of the halo. It doesn't depend on anything, right? It's basically a universal thing in large scale structure theory. So why it is, again, um, I'm sure some people know why you actually don't, right? but um, uh, what, we know, what we need to know is that there is this magical distribution of spin parameters, which is absolutely universal. Right? So the typical spin is 5.5%, 5, 5 but again, the, nev the number depends on, um, on what other numbers are. So, but if you uh, hide all the information about the halo in this way, then you get this universal spin distribution. So it means that for a given halo, the given mass, given radius, you can compute the energy. And knowing the distribution of lambdas, you know what the distribution of angular momentum those halos with those masses would have. And so the last step, the last quantity on the first slide, which was not defined, is this disk circular velocity. Right? So the model assumes that the disk has a flat rotation curve, so it rotates with the same speed and already. And in the original uh, more Mao and White model, um, the assumption was made that the circular velocity of the disk is actually related to the video velocity of the halo, which is video velocity just gm over the 
the video radius of the K1. Remember, video radius is what? What is the video radius? Come on. And the radius, the mean over density is the video over density. This 178 or 200, let's round up. So this is just, if you know the, the mean density in the universe, you know the mean uh, multiplied by 200 and compute the radius at which um, uh, the mean over density of the scale is 200. So that's all. <coughs> so uh, this one is easily computable for every halo. So the main assumption is the circular velocities are actually equal to the video velocity, but they don't have to be equal, they only have to be proportional. In fact, um, if you now take a density profile for the halo, mm -hmm. Uh, and we know that most of the halos have this NFW, Navarro, Frank, and White density profile, at least uh, outside the very centers. Mm -hmm. And circular velocity uh, over the video velocity of an FW profile has this rather complicated form, right, as a function of you know, radius in use of the video radius. And this function, if you actually plot it, looks like this. So it has a clear maximum, and this maximum is at c times x value 2.16. You can do it numerically. So if I now have a halo, this consists of a concentration. So who, who does not know what an FW profile is? Everyone knows. So this so the concentration, the halo is a concentration of three, which are the, which are the biggest halos we have today, like the big clusters. I think I think five max, three max, max, the maximum velocity, velocity, velocity is equal to zero. The video is the velocity. velocity. Okay, with the halo span, span, which would likely be like going to wait, so it's going to go to the other side today. And slightly, slightly high, it's high, it's like one point one point two. And then the latest, latest one, one ones, I think, I think halo is the worst of the lot. They would have one point six, but you see, it doesn't change very much. The max is bigger than video velocity, but it's not tremendous difference. And just to give you the number, the video velocity for the fact that of mass and the pan section ratio. So there's a Hubble parameter or a Hubble constant. But today for the Milky Way here, it's 167 kilometers per second. So it's actually slightly um, lower than the rotation uh, speed of the disk. Uh, the disk goes about 220 or 240. So uh, it turns out that this model works really well. It makes uh, many different predictions. Um, for example, you can compare the size of the disk, compare with the radius of the halo, the video radius of the halo. And they turn out to be linearly related, just like this model predicts. So this um, y-axis, y-axis here is a size, is actually half light radius. So it's a radius which contains half of all light in the, in the galaxy. So you can relate it to the disk scale, scale length by simply you know, taking exponential and finding where exponential equals one half, so something like log two times two, something like this, times the um, uh, scale length. And this is the video radius multiplied by 0.015. Mm -hmm. And this line, the dashed line, is one to one. So this equals that is this dashed line. And so what you see that observations here, different observations, uh, some points are just individual galaxies. There are bands for big samples of galaxies with a dispersion. And it's actually consistent right, with this linear relationship. And this is actually the K of the mass from all the way to 10 to the 8, which is really tiny. Right? Uh, those galaxies are so small, you can always put, put them in your pocket. Right? There's dwarf spheroidals in the, in the local group, the tiniest uh, of them. And then all the way going to really big uh, ellipticals, which are centers of big clusters, right? They're sitting in halos of 10 to the 15 so masses, right? So the central ellipticals of really big clusters. Um, so uh, they all fall on this line, right? and there's obviously scatter, right? So it's not a one-to-one -one relation. They're distributed, but in fact, if you look how much scatter there is, it's entirely consistent with the scatter on this log-normal relationship. So it's entirely consistent with um, just taking the disk radius as a given fraction of the halo video uh, radius, factoring out the fact that you have you know, this angular momentum of a given halo will change, and so a disk will be smaller or larger depending on the exact value of the angular momentum. So it's perfectly consistent with this um, very simple um, Momauen white model. Um, so that actually gives you some confidence that some basic physics in this model is correct. And so if you want to get a picture of what galaxy formation is, you can just use this model 
as a first approximation, and you get many things right. I'm sure there are details which are wrong, but uh, overall it, um, it works well. Right. So uh, let's now talk a little bit about disks. Right. So we have the surface density of the disk as a function of radius. Um, and the circular velocity of the disk can in fact be computed from the density. Unfortunately, it's not nearly as a simple an expression as for spherical, uh, spherical symmetric distribution. Right. For spherical symmetric, you know that Vc of R is just this. And unfortunately for this, it's a little bit uh, more involved. Right? So if you know the sigma, knowing the sigma of r, you can compute this quantity s of k. And knowing this s of k, putting this, in this integral, you can actually get vc uh, circular velocity squared as a function of radius. Right? So this is the radio distribution. But of course, disks are not infinitely thin. Right? So in a vertical, um, very often they call the D direction because historically disks were model with cylindrical symmetry and so Z is a um, direction perpendicular to the plane of the disk. Um, so in the vertical distribution, the disk profile is described by scale height H. So you can think about characteristic scale of the disk. Um, I'm not showing you the exact mathematical form for this profile because um, different disks have different forms of those profiles. There's no sort of universal one. The disks are exponential in radius, but they're not you know, all exponential in Z, for example. Um, and in addition to that, different components of disks have different scale heights. So the rule of thumb for the Milky Way, the molecular gas has a scale height of 70 parsecs. The atomic gas has a scale height of 150, and stars have a scale height of 300. So if you go from molecular gas to atomic to stellar, it increases by a factor of two, right, very roughly. And of course, it will be dependent uh, uh, where in the disk you are. It's, it's those numbers are for the, our, our local neighborhood. Yes. Um, but as I said, disks are exponential right, to amazing uh, uh, accuracy. And so what I show here is the surface density as a function of radius. This is for stars. This is sigma star, actually, versus radius, which is normalized with half-light radius. Right. So you take. Uh, galaxies of different sizes and masses, etc., and you scale your uh, density profile of the disk to the density at half-light radius, and you scale radius to the half-light radius. And then you take galaxies, in this case it's actually stellar masses. Stellar masses from between 5 and 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, all the way to 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. And I think with 10 to the 12, so masses is a really big elliptical galaxies. Right? The Milky Way is what? You know it? I showed that number. What is the stellar mass of the Milky Way? You live in that. You need to know that it's five times ten to the ten. It's in the middle of this band. Right? So five times ten to the ten. Um, so it's fifty billion solar masses and roughly hundred billion stars. Um, so those are really big ones. And you see, they for different lines of different colors, you can actually separate any trends in the color. So they all fall in this profile, which is roughly a straight line. And this actually. It's, this is linear, unfortunately. And so this line is exponential. Right? And so this galaxies which change in mass by six orders of magnitude, when you scale the disk profiles, they all fall within this line within a factor of two variation at most. So it's amazing regularity in how galaxies disks are distributed in the radius. And the same actually applies to gas. Right? So this is now sigma of gas divided by the same normalization factor versus radius. And you see this number goes from 0 to 6. This goes from 0 to 10. Um, so the gaseous disk are actually larger than stellar disks. But they're also very closely exponential. Right? Again, there's variations, deviations from exponential uh, factor of 2 at most. Right? Yes? So uh, in log linear maximum gray dust disk are gone. So isn't that just the bulge you found? Uh, right. So this, is, um, this may be the bulge, yes. Uh, it's supposed to be bulge now. No, it's not. Um, I think what you're actually seeing is that on the outer parts, they're not quite exponential. So I'm not, I'm, I think, fooling a little bit. But um, yeah, so this, this looks quite straight, right? Um, uh, in fact, when you, what the plot is missing is that if you have these numbers, you can actually draw the line which should correspond to those two numbers. There will be actually a fixed slope. 
I'm not sure what it is in this plot, but I can, I can, I can do it tonight. Um, so again, the point is that stereo discs are close to exponential, at least in the inner part. Right? Um, and the um, uh, gaseous discs are also very close to exponential in the outer parts. The bouch, by the way, on this, on this picture, the bouch would be somewhere here. Yeah. Yeah, it would be tiny. Right, so this is half light radio, so for the Milky Way, it's like three kilopascals or something. And for um, uh, the bouch in the Milky Way, it's 0.5, so it's 1, 6. In this is a 1, so 1, 6 and 1 here. That would be the bouch. I think bouch is actually uh, split as here. Um, so with scale heights of the disk, the situation is less clear. Um, it may be just my ignorance. Um, uh, it's also very hard to measure, right, because um, to measure the radio distribution, you can take any picture of the galaxy, correct for the inclination, and just do photometry, and just count how much light you have as a function of radius. The scale height is hard because you can really measure it only in galaxies with exactly edge on. Because hmm? if it's inclined, then you all, all projects on the sky, so we don't know which one is on front, which, which side is in, in the back. So there are a few galaxies which are edge on. And so, for example, I have this. Uh, I just happen to have pictures of those two dwarfs. Those are dwarf galaxies. They have masses between 3 times 10 to 9 times the 10 so masses. So it's something like um, SMC and LMC, maybe even slightly like smaller. Right? And um, for these ones, you can have both the contours are H1, so it's a, a hydrogen 21 centimeter emission. And uh, the color, the grayscale, is actually stars. Right? And so, for example, we can clearly see here that the H1 disk is very fat and the stereo disk is very thin. Right? So in the Milky Way, I said the gas disk is thin, 150 parsec, and stereo disk is thick, well, relatively thick, 300 parsec. It's still very thin from point of view of you know, scale height versus the size of the disk, which may be 10 kiloparsecs, right? It's still 3% of its size, right? So it's very thin from geometrical point of view, but it's thicker, significantly thicker than um, the disk, the gas disk, which is really, really a dinner plate. Um, but in this case, it's actually the other way around, that right? this galaxy has a very thin stereo disk, and very fat gas disk, right? So the stereo disk here is about 300, and the gas is 600, and this one, which one is this? Right? This one is actually 800. So I know, I also have happened to know values for M33. M33 is not very big, but it seems to be more uh, similar to the Milky Way. So whether there is a trend so that the big galaxies have fat stereo disks and uh, thin gas disks and dwarf galaxies Otherwise, other way around, I'm actually not sure. And I don't know anyone knows, but maybe someone, someone does. Mm. But it's definitely there is a variation in the relative uh, thickness of stellar and gaseous disks for different galaxies. Um, so the Milky Way right, is a typical spiral galaxy. So it does have a rotation, flat rotation curve. So this is a plot of circular velocity of the galaxy versus radius. Right, and those different measurements, points, it points with error bars, actual measurements on rotation curve. This is a relatively old plot, but I like it because it shows all these different pictures to, or different contributions together. It also shows contribution to the circular velocity from the bouch, right, from the disk, disk and bouch together. And as you know, with large radio disk and bouch fall off, so that, that was um, the first evidence for the dark matter. Right, so if you add a halo, then you get this line that is quite <coughs> consistent with um, data, right, so it's kind of flat. Also, <coughs> flat rotation curve doesn't mean that it's really flat, like you know, planes of Illinois. Right? Um, and so this is, is another model. Right? So it's just a different model with different parameters. Um, it's called, it's called the maximum disk, where the contribution of the disk to rotation curve is cranked to the maximum. Right? You can still make a decent fit to the measurements. Right? So remember that rotation curves, uh, they're all kind of flat, but they're really kind of. Right? So just like people, rotation curves are all very different. So this is just a plot, again, from a old paper. Those are different rotation curves um, in which the radius is normalized to the scale length of the disk with exponential characteristic lengths. And so some of them are rising and then flat. Some of them are really, really flat. Some have bumps and wiggles. So um, there's a huge variety of them. So they're all kind of flat, right? but they're not exactly flat. Right? And there are some which are rising, some which are falling. Um, and some which are you know, truly, truly flat for a very long distance. This goes to 10 times and the uh, scale length. So scale length of the disk from the Milky Way is two and a half kiloparsecs. So if that was Milky Way, 
it will be flat to 25 kiloparsec, quite far away. So um, if we really want to study the disk dynamics, it's a really, really complex subject, right? So I'm not going into that. Um, and there's a whole you know, subfield of dynamical astronomy. Um, but by looking at pictures like this, you know that the disks are very complicated. So there's uh, some of these grand design spirals, there are all kinds of small scale structure. If you look carefully, you can basically spend several hours looking at this picture and learning physics just by looking at it. Um, but what's important, the one lesson which I want you to remember is that rotational velocity is not the circular velocity, right? So I talk about circular velocity and the velocity which a disk actually rotate may not necessarily be the same, right? Especially in, obs in, in observational astronomy, those are equ equated very, very often. And that's a very serious mistake that people often make. Right? So, and just to understand physically why, why they're not the same, think about spiral waves. Right? Spiral waves are actually shocks. Right? And so you know in the shock there's actually change in the velocity. Walker um, talked about that. Right? So the velocity changes abruptly. And so the gas cannot move in a circular orbit. If it moves in a circular orbit before the shock, it cannot move after the shock or the vice, uh, vice versa because there's an instantaneous change in the velocity. So you cannot have two different values which sit on the same rotational velocity. So spiral arms are places where um, uh, this, this like the gas does not go in a circular orbit. Right? So rotational velocity is different from circular velocity. Of course, you can say, well, the spiral arms, these big ones are kind of exceptions only in a very big galaxies. But if you look in a normal galaxies like the Milky Way, right, they have what's called flocculent spiral waves. But there are still waves, there's still shocks, right? So there are even actually more of them. So all galaxies have shocks and waves, and so all of them um, have places where the gas motion significantly deviates from the uh, perfect circular orbit. And so there are many of these famous con controversies like the scores versus CASP, right, a four-letter word which you all know what I mean. And you do? What do I mean? What is a four-letter word we're not supposed to pronounce? Mond, right. <laughs> so all those things come, come from, from um, uh, may come, at least in part, uh, due to this equality, to trying to equa equate those two things which are not actually equal. Right? And just to give you an illustration of that, right? this is again, this is a picture of M51, right? the one we showed before. And I, on top of this, uh, this is spiral, big spiral arms. This is actually the map of um, deviation from this perfect circular rotation. So you can take map of the 51, uh, measure the circular velocity, and, this, and then just at each point, at each pixel, just measure the actual velocity of the gas and see how much it deviates. From this, right? So those, I just showed that that's indeed, indeed the, ma the map for that galaxy. And when you look at this map, right, what you see is that this is the axis. It goes from <coughs> minus 50 to plus 50. And so this red and blue are points where deviations from the circular velocity are 20 kilometers per second. Right? So 20 kilometers per second is four times as much energy as Ralph needs to drive all the turbulence in the molecular gas, right? So there's actually an enormous amount of uh, kinetic energy in the deviation from circular rotations. And those are, again, small compared to the rotation of the galaxy, which may be 200 kilometers per second, but they're not, not small as, um, as when compared to properties of the gas. Right? And even this 20, 20, 10, 20 kilometer per second deviations at the center can make a Caspi profile look like a core, for example. <coughs> So those are very important corrections that um, you need to understand they exist, right? So even if they are often ignored in uh, observational models, in modeling observational data. So um, they're often ignored because making a map like this is actually very hard. Right? So uh, um, I'm almost done. So I'm going to like in, in five minutes, I have a bunch of slides which um, I'm going to show you something which I feel um, is the grandest idea in whole, whole of astronomy, right? So maybe you don't show us, share what my, my, my impression, but whenever I think about this, I get really excited, right? Um, so again, this is M51, and it's just a very nice example of spiral galaxy. So if you look carefully at the morphology, right, you see um, what I want to do is, um, I want to risk raising the screen, but I want to shut down the light. So uh, if you look at the morphology of spiral arms, so you see this dark, dark, dark lanes, those are dust lanes, this is molecular gas. Then on the outer part of the spiral arms, you see this red stuff. 
This is actually dust heated by young stars, so dust in the process of being destroyed. And then this blue stuff is, of course, light from young stars. So the typical morphology of spiral arms, the inner edges, uh, molecular gas, and you have stars sort of destroying molecular gas, and then you have the blue stars. And then the space between uh, those arms, and in fact, filled with neutral atomic gas. You don't see it in this picture because you need a radio telescope to see atomic gas. But if I put a radio picture on top of this, this is a picture of 21 centimeters from M51. And the black, it's, an, it's negative, so black means where the emission is. That's where H1 is. And if you uh, combine them, you'll um, notice that it sits exactly between the spiral arms. So most of the, this gas is exactly between those two, these two spiral arms. So the reason why this morphology is such is because uh, most likely it, uh, spiral arms are actually density waves. Right? It's only one of the series of spiral arms, but I think by, um, uh, by now it's, it's by far the leading one. So there used to be more competing series which sort of died out one after another. So the density waves are not static objects. Right? The gas flows through them right? and flows them through a cycle which you can call galactic ecology. So think about uh, neutral gas, right? Neutral gas in the galaxy, diffuse gas, gets heat by wave. Mm -hmm. So the wave compresses the gas, and if the compression is strong enough, this gas will become molecular and turn into molecular clouds. So molecular clouds uh, form stars inside them, right? So those clouds which are first formed have, will have star formation proceeding in them, at the same time, the wave keeps going, creating fresh molecular clouds in front of it. And those stars eventually blow up molecular clouds by the feedback, uh, radiation, supernova, whatever. We'll talk about this later on Saturday. Right? But then those clouds which were just freshly made yesterday are already making stars, but the wave continues to go and new clouds are forming. And then eventually this hot coronal gas right, uh, flows together from this coronal phase, a hot phase of the ISM. Um, so eventually this gas cools and become again no normal diffuse neutral medium again until the next spiral arm comes with the molecular cloud. So we have the cycles of molecular clouds forming and destroying. Right? And, um, uh, and then if your wave is small, then it will be just whatever shape it is, but any big wave because of differential rotation is going to become a spiral. So the reason why a spiral arms a spiral is not because something particular happens, it's because the galaxy rotates differentially. And so if you think about differential rotation, um, because these different points move roughly the same velocity, rotation curve is flat, right? It takes a less time for this point to go around than this one. And so eventually any pattern you can draw, you can draw your face here and let it go, it will stretch into a spiral. So the reason why they spiral is because of the differential rotation, nothing special. So uh, the Milky Way also have spiral arms. They may not be as pronounced as an uh, um, M51, but they're still uh, there. And it, this, of course, a sort of map or artist conception, but the locations of spiral arms are measured pretty well using H1 um, uh, emission. So we are actually living here in a small spiral arm, which is called our local Orion spiral arm. There are big one, Perseus and Carina Sagittarius uh, in front, and then there are a few other of them and the thickness arm over there. So again, this is not a, just a cartoon, right? It's, it's a real distribution, it's a real map of real, just drawn by an artist, it looks cool, but it's actually a real map of real spiral arms in the Milky Way. So I have this funny quiz, which spiral arm does the sun form in? Um, it may look funny, but it's actually, it, it is conceptually a serious question. Right? So, if you can answer it, then you understand what spiral arms are and what sort of disk of galaxies <coughs> behave, how they behave. Who is for A? Huh? That's what? Who is for A? No one for A? Who is for B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. Who is for C? One. Who is for D? One, two, 
Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Who is for E? One, two, three, four, four, only four. How about Cygnus? Right? The rest of your mind is for Cygnus. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, there are more people in the room. <laughs> um, so this is a really, really unfair question, right? So the one you can really beat me for. Because how old is the sun? Five million years, right? billion years, 4.6 actually. Right, those are waves, waves come and go. So when the sun was born 4.6 billion years ago, there were completely different wave patterns. That is none of them, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, those waves, they, they waves come and go. Right? But that's the point, remember, that those things appear and disappear. The fact that we sit in this arm and just, just by chance, we just, as the sun goes around, just happen to cross this thing. Right? But when the sun was born, it was born in one of the spiral arms, but of course they were very different at that time. <coughs> so I said, this is what I think is the really grandest uh, idea in astronomy. If you think about uh, what those spiral arms are, right? Those are regions where young stars are born. So those waves right, have young stars on their crests, right? If you think about the ocean wave, with all those beautiful form on top, right? The galactic waves are even better because they have bright young stars on their crests. I think it's a very Cool idea. Um, and it is grand. Okay, so um, I think we finished with that right, because um, I'm supposed to finish already. Um, and so we continue on next tomorrow evening. We continue with disc, disc stability and more boring stuff. Um, so um, right now we are supposed to have this hands-on session. Right? And for this hands-on session, I'll have to connect. <coughs>